Oh, hey, Trey, Trey Yasuda. <laughs> nice to see you again, bud. Uh, good seeing you from uh, uh, Lionsgate days. And uh, as, as just to introduce you to the audience, you um, are in, an international business, you're international business affairs, international distribution business affairs executive, right? Uh, so many years in the business. I'll let you tell us more about your background, but um, just want to welcome to the show and and, um, and just jump right into a conversation. So so tell me, Trey, or tell us, Trey, like a little bit about you know how you got started in the business and and, and what you're doing now. Yeah, yeah, thanks. Uh, no, good, to, good to be here. Um, it's one of those things as, as far as getting started in. I don't think any kid grows up and says, you know what, I want to be an international distribution exec sometimes or lawyer. Um, I came down to LA back in 99 for law school, actually think I was going to be a sports agent. Really? And then I got, got quickly disillusioned by that industry. Uh, and, you know, I think agency in general, just chasing, you know, kissing ass to young talent, it just wasn't for me, especially 15 year old kids, uh, like athletes and, and trying to wine and dine kids. Mm -hmm. So that was, I got turned off pretty quickly. And then I thought music was uh, my thing and had taken, had done an externship with BMG Music Publishing and was thinking I was going to get into uh, the music side, legal affairs. But uh, fortunately, you know, I, I got this externship at this company called Intermedia, and I had no, no idea what that was at the time. Um, doing producing, financing, and also distributing internationally films. So I kind of was doing that just as, look, it's a gig on my resume during law school. Who knows, whatever. But it, it was kind of fortuitous that the, the music industry was dying at that time with Napster and everything going on and, you know, the the labels were, were getting killed and it kind of worked out that I kind of gravitated um, unexpectedly towards film. Mm -hmm. so I'm at this company called Intermedia and I'm learning, this is my last year in law school, mm -hmm. um, you know, learning about how films are financed based on international pre-sales, which was completely new to me or foreign to me, pun intended. Mm -hmm. um, and after I finished that externship, I took the bar without any prospects of a job, just saying, you know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna wing it when I come out. And they happened to give me a, which is, you know, not typical of, of getting into the business. Okay. They, they brought me back when I was studying for the bar, after I, I took it, they said, you wanna come back on a consulting basis and just do some, you know, some rights management type work. Okay. Um, I, came, I came back and then after they, I passed the bar, they said, hey, would you like to, you know, you like, like a job as a uh, junior attorney? which was pretty crazy for me. You know, most people, it's hard to break in if you go to law firm route or if you start usually starting as an assistant, making nothing and hopefully that something grows. So I got pretty lucky. Wow. Um, Intermedia ended up a couple of years later doing a, a joint venture with Summit Entertainment, which, which was the Twilight Company, John Wick, Red, mm -hmm. um, uh, and some other YA franchises. They did a joint venture called IS Film Distribution and uh, I just luckily kind of became the legal affairs guy for this joint venture. Mm. That lasted a couple years. Um, and then they were gonna wind that up, but Summit liked what I was doing and brought me in to the Summit side. Oh, wow. So I went from Intermedia as an extern to a job there to this joint venture with Summit to Summit. And then I was, I was um, working with their business legal affairs team on the international side on the film distribution side for uh, nine years. And then Summit got bought by Lionsgate and Lionsgate rolled me in. So I've kind of been at four different companies without ever leaving my job. That is, that is crazy. And ended up, uh, it's, yeah, it's very lucky. And I, I'm, I'm fortunate that one, they like me, but I also really liked the work and it was something unexpected, you know? So, and then I ended up at Lionsgate for six years and I'm now on my own consulting for a few different film companies. Okay. So tell me, I'm just curious, is Intermedia still around? Uh, no, they're, they're not. Yeah, they, they didn't uh, make it up. Yeah, their, their libraries with, uh, it's bounced around a couple times. I think it's this company called Ambi, A-M-B-I. Okay. Um, yeah, they were part of exclusive. Uh, they were, their, their sales went to exclusive for a uh, sec, uh, little while. And then I think their libraries with Ambi, but Intermedia itself is not it. Okay. Um, well, for the for the listeners and viewers that aren't familiar with some of the terms you use, and for the business in general, this sector of the business, let's break down a couple of things. Um, so you mentioned you were running kind of well, you were uh, working on the joint venture between uh, your company Intermedia and then um, Summit, and then so just so two things. One is what technically is a joint venture? 
compared to any other kind of uh, business partnership? And two, what exactly is it? What exactly were they doing in the distribution space? Okay, so what both companies did um, prior to forming this joint venture were they were producing and financing or co-financing pictures and then selling them separately. But when you're selling films internationally, it takes one, a sales team, it takes a legal team, it takes a servicing delivery team for the physical materials, it takes a marketing team. Mm -hmm. So they wanted to find some synergies here and say, we have, we both have product and we have two separate teams doing the same thing. The product, creating the product is gonna be separate. Mm -hmm. But why have two teams when we can combine forces and have one team doing the sales, one team doing the legal paperwork, one team doing the marketing, one team doing the distribution management of, of it and delivery. So that's the, that was the joint venture uh, that they formed between Summit and Intermedia called IS Film. Uh, and it was mainly a cost saving structure. Got it. Got it. So, so one company would allocate resources to the joint venture, the other company would allocate resources into this one entity and then this one entity would go off and do the thing. Okay. Correct, yeah. So you, you get rid of all the backroom, the two teams, the backroom side on both, on both, for both companies. Got it. And now why would a company invest in the international distribution market if they are a U.S. based company without, in, in theory, with access to domestic distribution? Well, you need both to finance a film. So there, if let's say a film's $10 million, um, unless you're a major studio that has their big credit facility, they're like, okay, we're producing this for $10 million and we're going to go to Warner Brothers UK to distribute UK, Warner Brothers Japan to distribute Japan, Warner Brothers Australia. Unless you're a studio that just pays for it and releases it, um, the, the many majors and independents can't afford to produce it without having some, without getting a loan against uh, international collateral. They're counting on, well, it's changed over the years. I mean, it used to be a large chunk that you'd get of the total budget from international sales, from going individually to the Germany's, the UK's, the France's, Koreas and you do all these sales and you're able to cover 60 70 percent of your net budget mm. that, that's gone down over the years for various reasons but you're counting on between the international pre-sales um, some soft money subsidies um, and then equity that the difference you're, you're trying to limit that exposure domestically because you don't know what the domestic whether you're releasing yourself like a Lionsgate or you're trying to sell domestically that's exposure and to the extent you can mitigate that by selling the world mm -hmm. territory by territory, then you, you know you uh, you you reduce the risk of that film not performing or not selling domestically. I see. So yeah. So you have, so you're in a situation where if you're gonna do if you're gonna fully finance and you don't have a deep pocket, like you said, a financing a partner like a credit facility, a bank, then you have to go do jump through these hoops and go to territories, find tax subsidies get bank loans, get equity investors to put, put together the full financing uh, for the project. Right. Right? Outside of the major studios, that's how it's done. That's right. how it's done. So it sounds like it can be really complicated. It sounds like lots of hurdles. It sounds like it could be a very attenuated process. So tell me this, what you had said, the industry has shifted from maybe five, 10 years ago to so that now it's harder to fi fully finance, or at least uh, harder to generate the same financing you could do in the, in the international territories. What was the main reason for that, 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 that pivot? Um, I mean, there are a couple reasons. Years ago, maybe five, six, seven years ago, video, package video, DVDs, Blu-rays were, were dying. Mm -hmm. That was that, that market wasn't really the same as it was before people weren't buying, but the streaming wasn't replacing it fast enough. So there was a big chunk um, of, of what, distributors were paying were based on certain um, mediums mm -hmm. and that and those were those were fading out and it wasn't being replaced fast enough and also they were heavily dependent because that they were heavily dependent um, on theatrical releases mm -hmm. and theatrical releases require names it's hard you're not going to put a big p a spin behind um, you know a small picture without any names so that became harder and when the streamers came in to play too you have you have someone that's killing, that's buying a product worldwide and, and the the distributors have less theatrical product to release, which again, affects how much they can buy in the future. Uh -huh. um, so it's, it was kind of a, a number of factors. And plus, it was also, it's also harder to get films made because with TV and all the streamers, um, the Hulus, the Amazons, the Netflix, 
so many people are working these days and to get talent and director locked in for a project is harder than it was before when that was what everyone was their main focus right. now you have people tied up on shows for for potentially you know like years to so to get big stars and directors on board and locked in to go to market to sell mm -hmm. is, is a tougher task these days you don't see them as many you know if you go to the the can or berlin or afm the big, three big international markets for features mm -hmm. you don't see the same level of, of product that you did five ten years ago wow it's, just, it's taking more it's you know and a lot of it has to do with it's a good thing that talent is working yeah um it, it's also it's harder on the on the independents that are trying to put films together so so tell me in, in terms of um the actual assembling of the financing package you know so net, because of all of these factors that have made it more difficult to finance with international funds how has the industry or the people the, your clients or other major companies adapted to these changes and but but first let's talk about like the process step by step what would the process be if i had 50 million i was a small studio not even 50 million probably more like i had 10 million but i needed 50. what would the steps be for me to fully finance my project using international money the first step is finding an internationally viable project project mm -hmm. so you want a script that you know is going to work internationally something like an american comedy may not may not translate internationally it's mm -hmm. it's very it's very u.s specific you yeah. want something that's like a, an action or uh, um, a thriller or things that that people can get wherever whatever language they speak whatever cultures customs it it's uh it transcends like the, the borders okay. um that i think that's the first step finding a, a project that you know has worldwide viability yeah. then you find talent that has worldwide recognition um and then you a director and so i think the first step is you find the, the right project then you attach two or three elements especially the director and maybe one or two main stars okay. at that point at that point you can really say okay this is the but this is what the budget's going to be this is what we we need from international if we shoot in new york or louisiana or another country this is what we're going to get in terms of tax subsidies mm -hmm. and then this is our exposure domestically and so you put all of that together and then they make the decision whether or not this film should uh, be greenlit based on on those on that mo the modeling say say okay we know this type of film with this cast based on all their comps on the low end it's going to do x on the high end it's going to do you know z and then we're going to base it on y that's going to be our projections right um and and if all that makes sense you green light it and you start you uh start selling it now, what are the general budget ranges for these the films you're describing, the films you work on? What are the general budget ranges for these kind of projects? For me, personally, because I've been at big companies, probably the biggest as far as mini majors go in international sales companies, uh, they were anywhere from maybe maybe 10 or high single digit millions to 10 million for the low ones that are more passion projects, cool, interesting, that still had you know potential for maybe it was maybe it was a horror or something that they saw like a potential breakout or it's um it's an awards type film that they just really like but typically speaking you're looking in that 20 to 40 50 million dollar range where you can have a list cast um but people can still afford to buy it God, you know, we, we started getting up at the Lionsgate days when you're in the franchise world you know and you have your twilights and hunger games you start getting high in big in those budgets um you're you're in the hundred million plus range uh -huh. and a lot of times that's what it takes for franchises you know to make your four or five hundred million domestically but it's also a big price tag for international and their markets may not be able to support that all the time i see okay so a lot of these a lot of these guys try to try to shoot for that 20 to 60 million range for high quality you know worldwide type of content um with a-list talent and you know directors but that's kind of their the sweet spot i think what everyone guns for yeah, the, lower, the lower ones can sell but again you have a harder time um the shippers will have a harder time pushing it theatrically and that's what they're depending on to to make back the advances they're paying for the film 
you know, because the main issue is that $10 million or $9 million project, it can't afford a major director, major star, as well as production, right? That's really the issue, right? Yeah, so in that case, it would be something that where the project is just really that cool and maybe there's a cast, there's cast that is known mm -hmm. worldwide. Um, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be A-list, but they know this is kind of like a cool project and cool talent, and we, we get it. Mm. That works, you know, five, 10 million. But again, you're when you're producing that size, you don't, a lot of these territories aren't, um, it's it's harder to ensure the, the theatrical release and theatrical return. Yes. Yeah. Whereas if you have a Brad Pitt and uh, Leo DiCaprio in something that's Martin Scorsese, if you had something like that, you know already that it's going to work and they don't mind paying the higher amount for that in the territory because they know it's going to go on, people are going to go to the theaters and see it. So can you think of uh, an independent, well not independent, but a small budget 10 million film that was able to successfully generate the returns because, you know? I, I mean, I, off the top of my head, I have to go back through the years, but mm. it, it's, it's not like it, it's not um, unlikely. I, I've just been fortunate where we've been working with bigger budgets. Yeah. Um, the smaller ones, on the on the flip side, the smaller ones could make it if if you're selling, um, you know, something that the, the price tag isn't as high. So it may, you may be able to cover a larger percentage of your budget depending on the project. Mm -hmm. It's kind of it's kind of interesting because if if it's too low budget, the international sales won't. Um, you know, they, they might be, how would I say that? So the higher the budget sometimes commands, commands higher percentages. Yeah. Whereas lower, they're like, we don't know it's gonna work. So it almost has no value. But then there may be a type of film where you can cover almost the whole budget from international depending on the content or the the um, the themes or, the, or the, the script. You're like, I know this is gonna work. It's so low budget, it's not a big expense, but it's gonna work in every territory. I'm trying to think of something example yeah um you know generally it's like uh and i don't know how who's selling the bloom house stuff but the bloom house stuff works oh, typically yeah, jason bloom house okay yeah. you know they're, they're make they, they know how to do it they know how to make five million dollar pictures that could have 50 to 100 million dollar domestic return is that is that the is that would you say that's the ratio like if just just generalizing and ballparking it if you have a film for five million or ten million for it to be really successful internationally, you want to be able to raise, I mean, you want to be able to generate at least 50 million in, in oh, revenue. Oh, no, that would be a breakout hit. I mean, okay. yeah, well, the, the, way you should, the way they actually look at it is if, if you're doing a $10 million project and you're getting, let's say five to 6 million from international, you sold that much. Um, and then you're exposed with after subs, let's say you're exposed like two and a half million domestically. That film, if it does, if it's released, you know, and you have your PNA spend, if it, if it hits that exposure in terms of box office, I think you're you're doing all right. If let's yeah. say you have you have uh, a ten million dollar picture and there's ten million in PNA that you put behind it and it does fifteen million at the box office, you're winning, I think. Right. And that, so I think internationally that that's where they gun for as well, because we're not when when we're selling. You break down territory by territory. If it's, if it's 10 million, let's say they're saying, hopefully we get 500,000 from UK. I'm just mm -hmm. throwing out there. If we get 500,000 from UK, in our minds, that's what the film is worth and should do for in the territory for the film to break even for the distributor. Oh. He, they're paying money against future royalties. If we don't see a dime, which tends to happen a lot, mm -hmm. you're, you're modeling it out as that's what that is worth for the distributor to not lose money. I see, I you see. Know? Interesting. That's what. That's how they figure out what they're going to pay for it. Got it. Got it. And so if they're paying five hundred thousand, and then they put another million dollars behind it in PNA, uh, and it does, you know, two million at the local box office. That's probably. I think they're probably going to be recouping by the end of all, by the term, and and will be will have done well. That's a win. Okay, so let's let's uh, drill down a little bit just so we can understand kind of the, the structure, the business structure of these international pre-sale deals, right? Because you mentioned royalties, recruitment, yeah. guarantee, and a minimum guarantee. Just walk through this, like, just the anatomy of it so we can understand. Yeah. It's the same example you gave, 500,000. So you go to the UK, uh, are there any well-known household name distributors in the UK that we can think that we can use as an example? You can use uh, maybe like Entertainment One. Do you okay. know, anyone, they, they've had a, uh, 
they they have distribution in well i mean they're changing their model now recently but let's use them as an example for um they've had they have benelux which is belgium Netherlands, luxembourg they have canada they have uk they have australia so they have distribution uh and in germany they were there they may be doing that now but um that's an example so okay. entertainment world. let's say let's use them as an example and they're going to they they let's like this let's film use, let's use a blue house title can you think of a blue house title to give it more uh, i don't uh, know you, you might know them but what's the last thing he did did he do did he does did he didn't do so he didn't do so did he did he do blair witch no we actually we did blair witch at uh at summit back in the day and we sold that but let's just use uh, let's use one of our titles that we that i know like uh, uh when i was at lionsgate um uh <laughs> Uh, La La Land, right? Oh, okay, okay. perfect. Let's just use La La Land, which did well in most territories world, worldwide. Let's okay. say so we're, we're selling that in, and we'll just call the budget 20 million. Okay. And the UK, they read it and they say, you know what? For us to buy, to license these rights for our territory for a period of, let's say, 20 years. Hmm. And that's a general, that period of time is pretty customary. 20 years. Customary anywhere from seven ten to 20 years is pretty okay. customary depending on on the territory and and what they're paying okay it's all fungible if you know if if you're paying more than you think the market price we may give you a few more years yeah you, you know um so let's say they think that film is worth um you know a million dollars for the territory that's what we're going to pay because they think for 20 years having the licensing the rights for theatrical mm -hmm. home video for the on-demand services streaming, for TV pay and free, um, and any other ancillary that we, you know, we license again, it could be that those are typically the the rights that they're going to get. Mm -hmm. They think through all through the cycle of that twenty years, I will make money on this on this event. But real quick, so is there? So what would the formula be for them? Would they say I need to make three times my minimum guarantee? Yeah, I, or ten I, times or. I, it's not 10. I, I maybe it's making gross receipts being uh, Yeah, three times. Let's say I So so they, 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 it, depends, they, it depends on what they're putting behind the PNA and everything and they will recoup. Yeah But let's say generally speaking they're giving you a million dollars as a guarantee since you're the, you know, the rights holder yeah. And they generally speaking may want to make three times that amount of so three million dollars um, in addition to whatever PA that they put to promote the film. Because they're paying against, they're paying in advance, giving us money against uh, our share of royalties. Mm -hmm. So let's say, just keeping it simple, that you you put your PA, that's a cost that's going to be taken off the top. So we, we make we make a million dollars from uh, theatrical. Mm -hmm. That means 50% goes to you, 50% goes to us, but we're holding your 50%, that 500,000, until we recoup the million dollars we gave you as an advance. Exactly. So we didn't recoup that advance yet from theatrical. Then we go down to the next medium mm -hmm. and home video. And then home video, let's say, is just keeping it simple, 50-50 as well. They make 500000 home video. That means 250 for you, 250 for us. Mm -hmm. We're keeping your 250 until we, we recoup the balance. We're at 750 now. And you just go down the line mm -hmm. until. And then once you get, once they've recouped that that million dollars from our, from the producer's share, of mm -hmm. grocery, then they pay the producer's share what's called overages. And so you're always, I mean, it's a win when, when you're a producer and can get overages from a territory. Uh, it sounds like it's kind of rare. It's kind of, it's not, it's, 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 not, it's not rare. Yeah, it's, it's not, uh, it, a film's doing well if you're getting overages. Got it. Because you're yeah. usually modeling it out. When you're selling it, you're thinking, this is what I think the territory's worth to break even. To break even. Oh, I see. So. It, it, because if it's not, then we're, we're underselling it. I see. To break even. Got it. You're not making yeah. overages. Yeah, because if you're baking overages, then why don't you sell it for a higher MG? Got you're already if you're already anticipating overages. And then what's the formula that the distributor in that territory will use to pay the the, the rights holder overages? Is it ten percent? Is it is it is it a connection between the minimum guarantee, the MG, and that overages payment, or is it? That, that's just the continuum. So if there was a 50-50 split theatrically, oh, I see. Same. That would that would go, and it does. You know. $3 million in the box in, in theaters, then they would take 50 or, you know, film rentals, I'm saying box office, let's say they get from the, from the exhibitors, they get uh, $2 million. Yeah. Or three, let's say $3 million they get from exhibition. Then they take 50% and we get 50%, one and a half, but they, so they keep 1 million of that to, to recoup 
the advance they paid and 500,000 goes in the producer's pocket. Got it, got it, got it. And then once they've recouped everything, I'm guessing, so I'm assuming when you're getting paid in overages, all they're taking out is maybe other additional expenses from that, from your 50% share. Yeah, and those would be, those would be yeah. nominal at that point, I think, yeah. because yeah. they're calling. Now, let me ask you this. I mean, thanks for explaining that. I think that helps a lot, especially people who don't know the world. So let me ask you this. You know, sales agents and distributors, international distributors, kind of tend to get a bad reputation, right? People, they're known to be not as not as honest. Why is that? Why is that reputation in there? I don't know if the, I don't know if that's the case, though. Um, oh, really? Okay. Yeah, it, I, I think in any industry, certain companies may get a bad reputation. Certain companies have a good reputation, and I don't think it's necessarily international marketplace. It, it More than be, anything else, it okay. can be producers, it can be agents, it can be managers. Some are going to be have uh, have better reputations than others. I've always been fortunate enough to be. Um, with some that are, I think, are more re reputable. And I think maybe the reputation for some stems from the fact that they can't deliver what is promised. Yeah, yeah. Let's say you, you sell them, you, you have a film that has, you, they read the script, they see the talent, they see the director, it comes together, it's, it's crap, maybe that. Mm -hmm. Maybe they can't get a US release, which they promised them. Maybe they, um, they don't have the materials they up to up to standard mm -hmm. uh, so there's little things and it, it could be you know just not not um over promising perhaps uh, and under and under under delivering right. that could that could be it but that's part of the it's part of the game as long as you're above board with it everyone's rolling the dice and taking the risks on success and now we didn't discuss this but how would you layer in the sales agent into that business transaction and it would be common for a company or or a studio that has a film that's worth fifty million dollars on a budget. Like, is that is or the sales agent more customary on the lower end part? No, the sales agent would be involved uh, uh, on any on any size project. Uh, it's really it's necessary if you're a company that doesn't have a sales team um, as part of, as part of your the overall um, company. Mm -hmm. Then you need to engage someone usually at a Five, ten percent, fifteen percent, depending on the on the budget size, mm -hmm. they're going to they're going to do all that for you. They're going to take the film to market, uh, properly market it for sales, do the sales, do the papering, um, help with the servicing and and marketing to the extent. They're going to basically be your international liaison yeah. from beginning to end. Are they also connecting your proceeds and then paying you, the studio? Uh, typically, no. Okay. No. Okay, so typically no, but sometimes you see that happen, right? I, I mean, I guess theoretically it could, or there's a or there's a collection agent that everything goes to that pays you know all the participants. Okay. But typically, the, typically it's too much exposure. Uh, a sales agent shouldn't collect unless okay. the sales agent it has some fear that of getting paid themselves. Mm -hmm. In which case, I think you'd still want it from just a legal standpoint to go through a collection agent rather than have the responsibility of collecting and then reporting out. Okay. That's an extra layer of exposure. All right, and then in terms of the players, you mentioned E1 is a very reputable um, district, uh, district, international distribution company. Uh, Boomhouse is a very reputable production company that's able to, you know, effectively. I, I, I don't know who, yeah, who who does Bloomhouse sales. I'm just using them as an example of ones who know how to do micro budget films. Yeah, that's what I mean. Yeah, so like, so are there other international distribution companies that you can think of that would be A players, very reputable? Massive. Yeah, I mean, there are a bunch. Obviously, there's the, the Lionsgate, there's STX, which yeah, uh, STX, okay. uh, Annapurna, now they go through Mad River. Um, there's Endeavor Content, which is part of William Morris. Uh, yeah. Sierra Affinity, which became part of E1. There's uh, Film Nation. There, there are a bunch. Um, I've worked with, I worked with a few, Solstice Studios, AGC, Anton Capital. There, there are a lot of international sales agents, some, and some handle the 40, 50 million dollar star driven projects and some handle the 500,000 million ones. And that's, it's a different, it's really a different world entirely when you're on those levels. Cause some you'd sell to the bigger international distributors, others you're going to small platforms and saying, hey, do you want to buy this, uh, these, these uh, over the top rights for instance, or, you know, TV, you don't, you may not have the same relationships because you're not selling the same films to, to the bigger bigger players in the territory and i'm assuming and again we know i know you don't work in this space but i'm assuming there's also those those folks who are experts on the micro budgeted yeah million, six million 
which I got to imagine has got to be a lot of work for not, it, not much money. And that's the thing. I, I'm, I've been very spoiled over the years being with the company because you know you're going to have A-list talent. You know you're going to have a demand when you go to the markets and sell. You know you're going to be the darling with your projects. When you have to grind it out on those low-level films, um, that's a lot of work. And it's not that you're, it's not any less work than, than the bigger projects. Mm -hmm. It may be, uh, I mean, in terms of what is involved from, from soup to nuts, you know, as far as you have to still market the films the same way. You still have to have off space. You still have to have meetings. You still have to sell. You still have to do the paperwork and the servicing of the, the materials. And, and it, it takes the same amount of effort, but mm -hmm. it's a harder, it's a harder grind. So, so what are some of the custom, like typical things that can go wrong during the process of raising this capital, like that you've seen that you have to get involved in and you have to wait till it's like, are there any pitfalls that always pop up with these kind of deals? Um, yeah, I mean, so to close, to close a loan, if you're, if you're depending on um, international collateral and, and soft money to, uh, collateral to, to get a loan for the mm -hmm. film, our production, mm -hmm. that requires also, you know, that, that all the pieces in, are in place prior to the start of production. Mm -hmm. So that means all the international deals have to be signed and papered and there have to be notices of assignment to the bank. That means that your, your tax credits and everything have to be vetted by, uh, advised by someone, an expert in that. And then, and, um, any equity has to be vetted and by the bank and the bond company. And there has to be a completion guarantor that says all these elements, um, the budget makes sense. It can be done for that price. All of these elements are, are locked in um we're going to guarantee that this film worst case will get made and the and the bank needs that that bond to close before they will loan against all of that collateral so that's a difficult task because if you have a start date and everyone's gunning for this but you haven't the bond isn't in place because of certain elements not being completed in time then you have to you may have to push you may have to get um a bridge loan to cover extra costs for pre-production that have been going on but you you know so it, it is a uh, things I've been fortunate films really seem to seem to get uh, it's like it's like I guess production even though that's on my side you're having you're facing fires all the time but it seems to always work out in the end people push through somehow sometimes you think things are never going to come together in time and you're screwed and you just waste this money and somehow people make it happen it's kind okay. of like so I'm going to recap that for the folks that, are, again, are new to this space. So, yeah. so because I want them to understand this, when you're raising capital, we use the example of the UK, you know, E1. When you're raising capital in these territories and you're getting this minimum guarantee, the E1 is not handing you a check for, you know, $3 million, $2 million, dollars They're giving you a commitment document, a contract saying right. that, if if these things if you finish your financing the budget's complete if these stars agree to perform or whatever the condition precedents are then i am going to pay you money and then what happens is the bank right you take that to the bank and the bank says like you just did like they verify that all of your pre-sales all of your minimum guarantees are accurate verifiable the money you're getting in tax credits is verifiable the the you know the producer from russia who gave you five hundred thousand dollars He's, he's legitimate, he's not a drug smuggler. All these things are legit, and now the banks will cut you that check for whatever that gap is, 20 yeah. million, 10 million, so you can go into production, right? That's right. And okay. uh, with one caveat, you also, in addition to these contractual commitments, there tends to be, in the majority of cases, a deposit too. So mm -hmm. a 20% deposit, 10% deposit, depending on the territory, maybe if it's like a riskier one like China, 40, 50% deposit. Um, and then together, so with the, the contracts and the notices of assignment to the bank and these deposits, that's what they'll need on the international side. Mm, so okay. so there is skin in the game at that point too. It's not just a commitment. Got it, guys. So you have Let, some yeah, and the banks also look at all of the distributors. You know, they've been in this business a long time too. They have discount rates to, for each distributor based on their reputation. And so there's a chart they say, oh, we know these guys are, are really reputable and big players in the territory. We'll give 100% of their contract. We can loan against 100. Others are like, okay, it's 80% because there is some risk. Mm -hmm. We're going to loan against 80%. So you have to factor that discount rate. And some are maybe 50% because, so you take up, let's say it's a $100,000 minimum guarantee from a riskier distributor. Mm -hmm. Say the 100,000, they're going to pay 20,000 deposits. So you have an $80,000 commitment. Mm -hmm. 
we're going to loan 40,000 against that 80,000 balance mm. just because of the, who the distributor is. So you always have to factor that in too. You're not necessarily going to get a hundred percent of, of your pre-sales. Yeah. You may, you may, depending on, on who the bank is and, and, uh, or the lender it's that, that, um, that does happen, but you always have to factor that in too. Then you need to go to that bridge loan we talked about because you yeah. need to go. So yeah. is there, are, is there, are there banks that dominated the space that you can name? Yeah. Uh, you have union bank, you have Comerica, um, I think East West gets involved sometimes. I mean, those are the two main ones that I, I deal tend to deal with a lot. Um, Aperture has been recently uh, that space. Ingenious is a is a lender and equity partner that is a UK company that that um, works a lot with the clients I'm dealing with. And then, how long a period of time would you say, on average, it takes between commencing with the presale negotiations to getting green light from the bank to get the money to, to finance the project? Well, the green light happens before even the presales. That means the project's a go. Closing, oh, closing the bond. Yeah, I guess. Yeah, I guess you got the green light on the project. That's what I mean to say is, but you don't have all the finance. The green light on the money. You don't have all the financing. For yeah. The, so when I, I, I would call that like closing the bond or closing the loan. Okay. So that that tends to happen. It depends on how early you, you sell it, but typically, you're not selling a project that's going to start production in a year. That just you're you're typically selling a project that's pretty close to starting. You know, because you have to have all these components in, in place and and uh, have to have their schedules work out for everyone. So usually when you're going to a market like Cannes, you're selling a film that in May, that's gonna start in June or July, let's say. So the, typically, you know, you have a month or two, three to get your all these all this paperwork in order. So tell me, so walk us through what it feels like at an actual market based on what you're called there to do, right? So, you know, you're at Berlin Cannes AFM, just walk us through kind of like what those early conversations look like and then kind of what you get called into yeah. the period of time you do it. So the, com the sales people, the ones that are actually the sales guys, the marketers that, that, that talk about the creative aspects of it and what it will do and what the comps are, they'll have, they'll set up meetings for an entire week with all with, you know, there are a lot of buyers in every territory, a lot of distributors in each territory, maybe, you know, three, four, five, but they, typically have relationships with one, two, that they kind of go to, they know that are their reliable buddies that will, they'll show the project to first if, is, and assuming that, you know, it's, it's not a impossible sell, they usually kind of stick to the same guys, mm -hmm. in, in most territories. Mm -hmm. So they'll, they'll take a distributor, the, the distributors um, buying reps in, into the room mm -hmm. and they'll have, you know, the poster on the wall of what, of what it is. They'll, they've already read the script um they'll sell they'll talk about why this director why this talent what what the comps are what they expect of the project and it's it's really just a sales pitch at that point um and then assuming that you know there's some excitement and they get they take an offer from that distributor they may meet with another one or two distributors and get multiple offers mm -hmm. and then have have second meetings with each of them and saying okay you know what um i need to get to this number we're, we're let's say my number was five hundred thousand for this territory and we have three offers, um, you know, 300,000, 500,000, 600,000. It may be where you want to sell it to the one that has not the highest offer, but you need to get them up to where the other guy is. Cause it's, you know, you, you can't put that money on the table, but you know that this distributor you like better, you know that they're, they're, they can handle the film better in the territory. So maybe they're more reliable, just maybe they're better for this kind of release and yeah. you want to get them up and they'll make the decision. Okay. we. We we um we're going with this offer. The, either the money's the price is too high, or we want we want to work with these guys. And then at that point, they call me in, and I usually know. Um, I, I hopefully tend you know, if they're a reputable distributor in the territory, I usually have some experience with them, mm -hmm. and know the parameters generally. I can talk through with the sales and the salespeople do as well. But yeah. I'll help consult on that, um, and 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 tell them okay, well. In the ter with this distributor in the territory, I know generally they get 20 year terms. You know, I, I, that's kind of what I'm used to with them. Yeah. And, oh, let's, well, let's see if we can get 17 or, you know, we usually get a 20% deposit and then the balance paid on notice of delivery when the film is ready. And they'll say, oh yeah, okay, that's, that's right. I, I remember that. And, and this is what a theatrical split should be. This is what a home entertainment split should be. This is what the TV split should be. I usually have, um, just from, from all my years of dealings, some kind of uh, 
understanding for each distributor where that that should be. Yeah. Um, and it's, and, oh, sorry, I got it. No, and I was just going to say at that point, the salespeople, they close the deal, they, they close all, all the key terms. And then at that point, I come in and paper everything. And I'll do the contract with them and I'll negotiate with their legal teams. Usually that some are at the market, some are, are back home and it's by email after the market ends. Yeah, but sometimes it's, they're signed, yeah, sometimes okay. they're signed there and sometimes they're signed later. But that's what I was going to get at. There's usually, there's a need or a desire to have you on the ground. So I want to understand why is that, right? Because it, in the world we live in now, technology, you would imagine you can do this work from anywhere, but for some reason, these sales teams, these production companies, they want you present, right? So what's that? We were in can together and you were doing this in can when we were together, you know? So like, why do you need it? It really depends on, on the sales company. Some don't need that. They don't, they're, they're fine working um, remotely. Some want me, they, they like the security blanket of having a lawyer there that can, that can basically, uh, uh, cross check any type of uh, proposal or comments that, that their buyers are making and say, hey, does this sound right? What, what, what have you done in the past with these guys? Um, and, and help in, in that standpoint, having a real time. Because again, if they're doing a deal at, if they're having a meeting at noon in France, they're probably not going to get a hold of me uh, until, I see, until I see. later. So having me handy, like, hey, I, I'm just trying to close this deal. Do you think we can agree to this? Or is there anything I'm, I'm not? Uh, I'm missing that could be potentially uh, not 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 block the deal, but maybe it would be. Let's say I give you an example. Um, if there's censorship clause, for instance, where if for whatever reason it gets banned in the territory, the distributor has a refund. Mm -hmm. That we have to know that that cannot be some. The bank will not loan against that if there's a, a notice of assignment to the bank that has this contingency where the distributor could get out. And that the bank doesn't control or the, it's not guaranteed bonded it's not guaranteed so that's just an example and they may want just some advice on hey do these terms make sense is there something i'm missing uh, i'm going to close this now but i want to know can i improve here here what should i tell them based on your last experience something i should be aware of that i need to need to negotiate up front because we don't want to have this fight after the deal is closed and it's not really closed okay. because there's a there's a um maybe a commercial or legal point that isn't addressed up front okay. so that's kind of some, some, not all, not all uh, sales agents care to have me there. Some mm -hmm. think it's it's handy to have that security blanket of, of a lawyer available. Got it. And then looking, thinking about it from the market standpoint, in comparing various markets, is there a cultural difference between when you're in Berlin, putting aside German culture, but like when you're in Berlin, when you're at AFM, or when you're at TAM, or maybe at Toronto? Deal making transactional, is that market feel different in those different countries or is it more or less the same experience? Uh, more or less the same. Toronto was different in that it was more of a domestic dri driven market until recently. Mm -hmm. Recently, in the last few years, it's become more of a, a fourth type of international sales market. Mm -hmm. Not not the level of a can Berlin or um, AFM, but it's it's it seems to be shifting that way. Any idea why? Um, I think it's just the timing of it. It's a good, it's in between and people are screening films for others anyway. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's, if a distributor's in town, it's a good time to have a meeting with them. I see. And, I see. And possibly sell either, either sell, um, cleanup sales that weren't sold in prior market or, um, maybe they have a new project and that's just the right time to sell before it, because of when they're going to production. Because that's in September and then you have to wait if you don't sell between can in May and um, and AFM in November, you know, so that's a big gap. So sometimes people want to use that as a, as an interim market. Okay, okay. And then, you know, I mean, you mentioned this earlier, how the pre-sale market has changed. And, you know, I tend to hear that like that, the bottom of that market has fell, fell out. Like there really isn't the same reliability in that market as it used to be. So what what is the alternative if one exists for you know producers where are they turning to to complete their funding if they can't rely as much as they could on pre-sales like, uh i mean that's a tough one there, there may be fewer projects or they're relying on streamers mm -hmm. you know, they may have uh i mean pre -sale, for the people that are in my business that rely on pre-sales it's harder because you are expecting generally speaking a smaller percentage of your net budget from international sales as you did 10 years ago Mm -hmm. It's just a fact. Um, and then, you know, it, it's tough. You have more buyers in that you have 
and Netflix and Amazon uh, to sell to as well, or you know Apple TV or, or any of these these platforms that will buy the world from you. But what you do when you do that is you basically give your your international marketplace fewer pictures, and so it kind of you're shooting yourself in the foot, even though you may be able to make um, make the film and make give your or give a return to your investors. You're mm -hmm. also down the road probably uh, making it harder for the buyers to have good the, your distributors to have good product. So is it possible? So if you were to pro, you know kind of project what the business will look like another five to ten years from now, and with the growth of the streaming services, especially their international footprint, is it possible that the pre-sale market will go away altogether and streamers will control that? You know what? Uh, I mean, they've been saying that for ten years or so. It just seems like there's a way. It, it just seems that you know they it keeps going and some and there are I'm surprised you know, they've been saying what I I don't know if it's necessarily a good analogy but you know even when I was at Lionsgate I was I'd be in a Monday um, kind of uh, uh, the, the recap meetings and you talk about the DVD sales in the US and they're like I was always surprised at how I haven't had a DVD or, or a Blu-ray disc in 10 years probably I haven't used one but I'm surprised at how many sales there still are on blu-rays in America from the wall. Yeah, yeah. I'm telling you, those, you know, so that's good, right? yeah I mean even though I think you know, there are trends and it looks like it may slowly disappear but these these distributors the every country still has theaters operating every country still has um, whether it's be uh, whether it's actually physical video or on-demand services they they still or, or TV paying free they, they still need product you know it's well, not gonna be, it's not gonna be entirely Amazon and and, uh, and yeah. Netflix it's well gonna... we're having this conversation in the midst of the COVID epidemic right so what does this mean and we're also on the heels of what would be the opening of can and the other markets this summer so what happens to all of those projects that were planning on going to you know um, yeah. Can to sell. Like, what are they going to do? What's the alternative? It's rough. Um, you know, I, I, there are a lot that probably aren't going to get made now. Some mm -hmm. are getting pushed um, because some may have had a, a production start date in uh, June, let's say. Mm -hmm. But now they know they can't shoot in in June. They, can, they probably can't shoot in July. Maybe August. Maybe they, they can't get the schedules right because these actors or director are already committed at a later date to another project. And now they can't put it together again. So that's that's unfortunate for some. I'm sure that's happening to a lot where they had these ideas and it was like tentatively they were going to go to Cannes with something that was going to shoot pretty soon. Mm -hmm. And now it may not they may not be able to get the scheduling right to shoot. Well, um, but maybe this is maybe the answer to this is obvious, but it's not to me. But why not just have a virtual market where they just well, get they're, on the they're, they're trying that and we'll see how it works out. You, yeah. you know, I think it's like people are like, why do we have even have offices anymore. We can just work from home and do Zoom. I think there's still something about having people together. You know, you don't have the same competition. I think as well when you're when you don't when you're not face to face. You're not in rooms. You don't see your competition walking by too, and be like, oh, well, they're going to that office now. Uh, how like how was the reaction? What are you hearing? I think there's just something about the physicality of it that even and you know like if you're working from home versus working in office, when you see people, I don't I don't know. I don't know if, if it's going to change altogether. It theoretically could. Mm -hmm. I just think people, people like the physical nature of it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, when you think about film markets and festivals, I mean, there's that festive aspect of it that people want to experience all yeah. doing their deals. And you know, you can learn a lot, and you can gain a lot of. Um, I guess you can gain a lot of traction trying to make a deal happen when you can be in the same room with the person, right? So, I think I think so. that's what it is. They're trying. They're testing out the virtual market with Can this year. Mm -hmm. We'll see how it goes. Um, you know, and there's there're going to be films that are sold uh, and bought. But I just I just think personally that you can't you can't really replicate that energy of a of a market or a festival virtually. You don't have the same kind of it. You don't have the same push that that kind of like buzz where we got to make the. Deals are going on constantly around you, and we gotta we gotta make this happen. We gotta work. We gotta meet. We gotta drink. We gotta like. There's not the same selling aspect. A lot of it comes down to lunches, drinks, dinners. Yeah. And I think that it's hard to replicate virtually. And you you had mentioned on another conversation, you know, the clients that you have, most of which have been through just years of knowing people in the business, right? You don't have to you don't have a billboard or 
Sunset Boulevard. Like people just know, know to call you. So you probably don't need to do any marketing or promoting of your, your services, right? No, and, and I'm very lucky that you build relationships over, it was 16 years from the time at Lionsgate to, uh, sorry, at um, um, IS Film to through Lionsgate. It was 16 years. And what happens when you're a company like our size, you have also have a lot of colleagues that become former colleagues, but they're all moving up in the industry too. And yeah. so your friends now that were you worked with for five years are now running companies and and who are they going to call? <laughs> That's right. That's right. So it works out nice. It works out nicely. And, and it's also, I'm kind of lucky in the sense that there aren't too many business affairs people on the international side that it's, it's fairly niche, but that are on my level and not working in house. Yeah. So there, there were only a handful, you know, you, we all know each other. It's a very incestuous business. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm kind of like, it, it's word of mouth where if someone says, I need these deals done, oh, well, what about this guy that, you know, my, my boy, buddy that used to run business affairs at Lionsgate, he's, he's a free agent now if you want to use him. So yeah, I get a lot that way. Wow. And it's relationships too. What, what my value add is all the time is that, you know, most junior attorneys um, can do the deals. It's, yeah. you know, like, it's not, uh, you know, rocket science, but what it is, is knowing, knowing, having relationships with the distributors so I can say, if there's a stupid point, one, I know it's a stupid point because I've seen enough deals with this one distributor or others in territory. They know that, look, I've, there's, no, there's something that goes along with experience because you just have been burnt before. You, you learn from mistakes and you, you see, you know, what you can do better on the next deal. And just having experience in one is good, but also the relationships where I can say to their lawyer or their uh, acquisition exec or someone like, come on man let's why, why, why are you doing this to you you know and that's the kind of that's the kind of relationship where that's kind of how deals get done too i'm like dude what are you doing here we know yeah. we know better stop stop wasting my time but you can tell you those relationships yeah huh? you're overlawing the deal like this is yeah yeah you go hit, hit the like we, we know where you where you need to get i know where i can how much i can push you here you know how much you can push me here we're not going to agree on this just let's get it done and then those are the kind of conversations what that's what makes working with someone, you know, in this business that's on my level, a little easier. And that's, that's the value add. It's just that it's not necessarily being, you know, the, the best lawyer around on the deal. It's about having those relationships and knowing how to close a deal and how to protect your clients, but also be, you know, pragmatic too. Totally. totally. So well, we're coming to a close on the conversation, but I, you mentioned a couple of major franchise films you worked on. I just want to give you a chance of sharing anecdotes or, you know, experiences that come to mind, but like, you, I think you said you worked on Twilight, I'm sure you worked on um, Hunger Games and, you know, these big, um, big films. My, my, my coolest anecdote, and, uh, and it's one that I always talk about people, is that just how things come together, there's a lot of times no rhyme or reason, it's luck, okay? Yeah. Um, I'll give you well, two examples. So, La La Land was originally, when we for a couple of years, was supposed to be Miles Teller and um, Emma Watson, mm -hmm. and it couldn't just get together. Different couldn't come together for various reasons, and then price kind of, and then scheduling got mixed, you know, messed up, and we couldn't use them. And then it ended up being, you know, um, Emma Stone and uh, Ryan Gosling. Yeah, but imagine like that. That just and then it worked out, and it was a huge success. But you never know what what's going to make a film great. Like if that film got made with Miles Teller and Emma Watson, uh, and Emma Watson would it have been La La Land? Yeah. I, don't, yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And then another time, I don't know how <laughs> much share this time. Back in the Mr. and Mrs. Smith days, we were selling that for New Regency. I remember that. I was at Summit. And originally, it was Brad Pitt and um, uh, Nicole Kidman. Mm -hmm. I didn't know and, that. And Nicole Kidman fell out. She couldn't do it because of a scheduling conflict. And they, the company gave uh, Brad Pitt a picture of four, four women. And this is when he was with Jennifer, Jennifer Aniston. Uh -huh. And he's like, oh yeah, I like her the best. Let's go with her. And that, that ended up being his future wife. Wow. <laughs> and you know, again, if that got made with him and Nicole Kidman, he probably still would have been with Jennifer Aniston. There wouldn't have been that buzz around the film. There wouldn't have been all the drama, the marketing. You just never know how things will play out. It's because of something as, it seems as innocuous as that, to where his whole life is different. That's crazy. No, That's crazy. Yeah, like, and the film, the film's a success because it had like, for good or bad, had the promotion from his marriage falling out and him being with uh, Angelina Jolie, but it all happened because Nicole Kidman's scheduling. 
it's like a delicate dance, right, with all of these pictures. I mean, and I think everyone involved, whether it's the producer, director, actors, will probably all share the same perspective, which is one minute it's looking good, next minute it can fall apart. You know yeah. what I mean? And it's, it's, it is amazing sometimes how these things work out. But again, I guess the flip side of it is there's so many stories we haven't heard of projects that never got made because of, you know, yeah. the issues that come up, rights issues, availability right. issues, financing issues. So um, that's exactly right. I mean, that's why I feel fortunate for the, having the clients I have and working for the companies I work for is that they find a way to get them them done. It's very rare that that films will fall apart. Now, is there a company, I mean, I always think of Lionsgate as being kind of the, the biggest mini major, especially with an international distribution business. Yep. But is there any other company that rivals them or exceeds them present day in the international distribution? Um, I, I, I don't think so. I would say STX is probably the, the closest. Closest. Number two. Solstice is going to be, is trying to rival being a third. So, because again, it's because those companies have um, a US distribution component and that makes that makes a set, um, your sales that much easier. When you're a sales agent and you don't have a guaranteed US release, it's a harder sell at the market. When you know we're releasing this film, yeah. that's a huge factor that you, a box that you should check off. And so the reason Lionsgate gets the projects they have, the reason STX and, and Solstice now as well, is because they know we're gonna get 2000 screens in the US. Mm -hmm. And that's an important thing, not just for the talent and the director, but the international buyers um, as well. They know that, a lot of them want to want to piggyback off U.S. marketing. That's what that dr what will drive the territory releases. Yeah, and I'm, I'm assuming in your your role, the work you do doesn't exist at a major streaming service because they don't. Yeah, do, yeah they have their own financing and they do all the globe in terms of distribution. So yeah, they yeah they just they're just releasing on their platform, so they're not selling to anyone. Um, they will. They do have acquisition teams where they if they don't buy the world, they may buy up four or five territories that a, um, a sales agent couldn't sell. Yeah. So you may go to Netflix, you say, hey, do you want these five territories, like UK, France, Australia, and Canada, we have these available. Do you want this for the streaming service? And then it becomes an issue too, you know, you have to make sure that they don't release, they have to be held back to a certain window because they may want to release shortly after the US theatrical, but if they go too soon, then it may jeopardize all your other all rights deals in in all the other territories. Yeah, and I was I was hearing I was reading some article about uh, I think it was Netflix and their presence at Sundance one year and how it kind of threw a lot of things off. But um, but yeah, I think that that, that that's a variable that we've yet to really know how it's going to play out as they grow bigger and become more aggressive um, in trying to you know really control the market. But, you know, uh, the thing though too is that their I think their outlay is 17 billion this next year in content. Yeah. And, you know, a lot of it's going to be, it's their own productions now. They're like, why, why buy it from people when we can just, you know, produce our own uh, House of Cards and Orange is the New Black and all these other local, you know, La Casa de Papel and all these other um, Netflix produced film, uh, yeah. TV and, and, and films. Well, one thing I meant to ask you, throwing it back really quickly, because you also did, you also used to manage a lot of output deals or the... Yeah. The, wait, just real quickly, just explain that world in comparison to your pre-sales work, the difference in the role you play now. The, the only difference is that instead of having a pre-sale at every market for a film, you're having one initial pre-sale to cover a slate of films. Mm -hmm. so you'll have, for again, we're talking the, about the UK, we're going to say, is, look, we want you to be our partner going forward on all of our projects. Mm -hmm. So we want to know that you're committed to whatever this budget is, whatever our budgets, you're going to contribute 7%, I, let's just yeah. say 7% of, of the budget and however that's defined, but you're going to, you're going to be in it as our partner for that on every film. So as long as our films fall within certain parameters that we agree on, that we, we know you're protected, we're not going to throw you, like I said, an American comedy that may not translate in, uh, in the territory. As long as it fits within our defined parameters, you're on the hook for that money and we're partners. And that way we can guarantee, we know that when we green light a film, that this is this much we can count on from each territory. This this portion of the budget is already um, covered. Yeah. And that one, on, on, on one hand, it's great because it mitigates your risk um, on, on every film. But on the flip side, you may be capped where a film may be worth 10% of the territory based on the elements that you have in this particular film. Mm -hmm. But you're, you're only gonna get this 
this fixed percentage. Wow. So how many, on average, how many of those partners do you typically have in a slate? Is it like- is it, it just depends on the, on the, on the producer. Um, sometimes, you know, they may want to cover all the world, even small Asian territories. They want, they don't want to have to pre-sell. They just want to know that they want to produce films and they want to know that the world is covered. Uh, and so they may try to get a bunch in place, but you know, it's, it's harder too, because they have to, the, the buyers, the distributors in the territory have to know that you're capable of providing reliable content within these parameters, mm -hmm. film to film. They don't want to have to pay for something that may fit technically into these, into this definition of what the picture is, but isn't isn't a good film. Isn't doesn't work in their territory. They want to know that you are going to make commercial films for the, for their territory as well. So, so there has to be a track record too. So is it fair to say that the output deal business is going on the decline? Is that yeah, I would, I would say so. I mean, it, 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 there's a lot of distributors don't have the same streams of uh, revenue that they did before, as far as like whether it's video or TV, um, theatrical in some cases. Yeah, yeah. So they they don't necessarily want to commit for a few years on multiple projects if uh, if they don't know if it if the if there's a downward trend in their territory as far as their various media go. I see. Okay. Cool. Yeah. Well, listen, man, I think you gave us a real good primer on international distribution business, especially when it comes to pre-sales. This is really helpful. I think we can hit everything I was going to ask you, more or less. But, right. um, yeah, come, yep. Yeah. So, I just want to thank you again. I, I, I'll give, let you get back to the beach over there. <laughs> yeah, you that's right. It's it's and, uh, you know, do some surfing. <laughs> and, um, and hopefully we'll do this again the next time. We have a big title. I got a, a big project to talk to you about. You know what I mean? Sounds great. Thanks for having me.